In this lecture, we are going to present and talk about uh, an important topic in uh, power devices, that is the wide band gap materials and devices. Uh, it is an important topic, um, a lot of research development, but, but also uh, commercial devices uh, are being uh, developed and marketed now. The paradigm is completely different here. We are not using silicon as the base and modifying the silicon material in order to get the device, but we change the paradigm because we use a completely different material. These materials that we are dealing with now are wide band gap. That is, the band gap is higher than silicon. The summary of this lecture is the following. Materials figure on merit, wide band gap materials. We will then discuss about silicon carbide and then gallium nitride devices. Gallium nitride will not be discussed in this lecture, but will be the final and uh, lecture, the following and final lecture of this course. New materials. What we understood from uh, our lectures is that an important limitation and a lot of uh, design for power semiconductor devices comes from the fact that we need a, a very thick and low duped layer somewhere into the device because we need to block the voltage. This, is, uh, this has been studied for the PIN diode at the beginning, but we have seen that this is exactly the same in BJT, IGBT, SCR, and uh, every other device. This uh, thick and low doped layer will uh, limit the current flow. The main and most important idea that I can have in order to remove this problem is using a different material. This uh, different material, a material different from silicon, uh, should have uh, a decreased impact ionization factors. This means that uh, avalanche is more difficult to more <coughs> difficult to happen, and or we can have both if we are lucky. We could have increased carrier mobility because higher mobility means lower resistance. If we can use a different semiconductor material, we could use this new degree of freedom and uh, improve the performances with respect to silicon devices. Uh, the idea is not new, absolutely not new. These are uh, some uh, early papers. Uh, I know that it looks like Baliga made everything in this lecture, but Baliga is one of the important professors in the, in the field. And these are um, old papers uh, from Baliga. This is 1982, this is 1989. Uh, this is Journal of Applied Physics. This is uh, uh, Electron Device Letters. And these are the abstracts. This paper discusses the influence of substrate properties, and these, uh, these will discuss the uh, the, the, proper, the properties of other materials different from silicon. The idea is not new. The problems are from te the technology. These materials are usually more expensive, less technologically advanced, they have more defects, and these are the problems. And it, it, it's not easy to manufacture a device in these different materials that are different from silicon. The big advantage of silicon is that it is cheap, first of all, and we know a lot about silicon. We can make and manufacture complex devices with high yield, and this is important for silicon. In this paper, this is Z. This is another professor that wrote a, a book, an important book in power devices. This is 1978. In this paper, uh, for a generic semiconductor, given E, G, the band gap, and N, B, the doping of the drift region that is assumed to be uniform, in this paper, it is, it is demonstrated that with this relation holds. This relation says that the breakdown voltage 
is a function of the band gap and uh, uh, an inverse function of the looping. The, this uh, EG factor here tells us that uh, if we have a higher band gap, we need a higher energy in order to generate a carriers for um, impact ionization. And higher band gap means more difficult avalanche and higher breakdown voltage. From this relation, you can get that given a fixed breakdown voltage, the doping that we need is proportional to the square power of the, of the band gap. If we assume a not punch through design that is a, a triangular electric field at the onset of the breakdown, the minimum possible width of the drift region is given by this equation. This is the minimum width that we need to use for a given breakdown voltage. This is an equation that we know. Now we can then write that the thickness is then inversely proportional to the band again. Now, given uh, a fixed area for a given power device, A is constant for every device, we can then uh, calculate the on-state resistance for a unipolar device like a MOSFET or a shock diode. And it is given by this equation, that is the, um, the resistance, the resistivity, multiplied by the thickness divided by the area. And this is proportional to double V, the inverse of the mobility and the, the inverse of the doping. Finally, we get that the on state resistance is proportional, inversely proportional to the mobility and inversely proportional to the cube power of the band. It is then clear that if we can use materials with higher mobility and a higher band again, the on-state resistance for a given breakdown voltage can be decreased. In uh, the first reference that I showed you, 1982, uh, from Baliga, uh, he presented this Baliga figure of merit. That is uh, this parameter, uh, epsilon mu multiplied by the cube power of the band gap. In the paper, it is then shown that materials with higher figure of merit will provide lower on-state resistance. Now, this is the theory. Let's say, if we can have materials with higher band gap and higher mobility, we could improve on-state resistance, but materials uh, are not a choice. Which are the actual materials that we can use? This is a, a table of the possible choices. Uh, the first rule is for silicon. We have mobility, we have the, the electric constant, the band gap, and uh, this is the maximum temperature, working temperature. Here we have the baliga figure of magic ratio. This is the ratio of the BFOM divided by the value for silicon and it is by definition one in silicon. Other materials are, for example, the, this is JFM, this is the, the Johnson figure of merit, the, proposed in 1965. It is something always related to the material and that takes into account something different from the on-state resistance. However, these are figure of merits, merits for materials. And uh, the other materials that we can use are uh, gallium arsenide. It has, it has quite high mobility. The band gap is improved, but not so much. And the Baliga figure of magic ratio is around 10. In principle, we can get 10 times lower on set resistance for the same breakdown voltage, in principle. Then we have silicon carbide. Silicon carbide has a quite low mobility. However, the band gap is quite large, 2.9 electron volts. The Baliga figure of ratio is 3.1. The, 
this can work at a very high temperature. This uh, working temperature is based on the intrinsic carrier concentration. The higher the temperature, the higher is the intrinsic carrier, carrier concentration. Uh, if the temperature is too high, the intrinsic carrier concentration is uh, higher than the doping and you lose your junctions. You don't have PN junctions anymore. And uh, the consequence is that uh, materials that have higher intrinsic carrier concentration like silicon or gallium arsenide can work, let's say, in principle up to 300 Celsius degrees. Materials with a higher band gap like silicon carbide and gallium nitride begin with very low intrinsic carrier concentration because the band gap is very high and they can work at higher temperature in principle because you need higher temperature in order to generate a lot of intrinsic carriers. And then we have gallium nitride. The mobility is more or less the same as silicon. Uh, however, the band gap is very high and the baliga figure of merit is very large. This is not a complete uh, table. Uh, in, the, in this other table, we show uh, other materials. We showed other properties and we also introduced a new material. We have silicon again. This is silicon carbide. 4H is a particular uh, polytype of silicon carbide. We do, do not enter in these details. There are many kinds of silicon carbides with slightly different properties. This is 4H silicon carbide. However, silicon carbide more or less, these are the properties. And this is the breakdown field, let's say the critical electric field for these materials. For silicon, we recall this name, this number is 300 kilovolts per centimeter. That is 0.3 megavolts per centimeter. In silicon carbide, this number is 2.4. In gallium and nitride, this number is 5. And finally, we also have diamond as a possible material. I know that you studied diamond during the, your lectures during, in the school and everybody told you that diamond is uh, not a semiconductor material, diamond is an insulator material. And this is demonstrated by the very high band gap, the band gap is 5.4, is huge band gap. However, now there are, there is a quite large amount of research and development for materials made in the diamond, for devices made in diamond, and uh, this is now for us considered a semiconductor material. Diamond is then another possibility. Other important characteristics are, uh, for example, the mobility that can be very high in diamond, and uh, note Please note the intrinsic carrier concentration. These numbers are ridiculously, ridiculously small. That is uh, 1.5, 10 to 10 for silicon, lower than one in uh, silicon carbide, gallium nitride and diamond, because the band gap is so high that the probability of getting one free electron just for thermal energy is very low at ambient temperature. However, when the temperature increases, uh, the number of intrinsic carriers increases also. These are more or less the materials and in principle you can see uh, devices made in these materials could be very, very effective. Another important aspect is thermal conductivity. Please note has how, how much larger than silicon is diamond, for example. This will improve your the ability to dissipate power, to dissipate heat, and uh, this means lower uh, thermal resistance and uh, improved uh, power density for the devices in principle. These are the advantages, more or less, uh, that these advantages come from material cost and technology. There are also 
physical limitations. For example, in diamond, only P-doping is available. You cannot have N-doping, or better, there is a recent advancement, people that claim that they were able to N-dope a piece of diamond. However, this is not yet definitive, will be clearer, clearer in the following, the following years. In principle, in diamond, you can only have P-doping. This means that you can only design shocky diets, more or less. You cannot have bipolar side GBT. And uh, there are many, many limitations you have to cope with. The, the field of working with uh, these uh, materials is uh, usually named as wide band gap semiconductor devices and materials. We, we name with this uh, acronym every material that has a band gap that is higher than silicon. Uh, and in this short list, we present some of the advantages. Unipolar devices made in wide band gap materials are thinner than their silicon counterparts. The Baliga figure, figure of merit, merit is higher and then they will have lower onset resistance are on. This means lower conduction losses and in, and in principle higher overall converter efficiency. They will have higher breakdown voltages because they have higher electric field that break down. Thus, uh, while silicon shorty dials, for example, are commercially available typically at voltages lower than 300 volts, the shakti diodes made in silicon carbides are already rated at 600 and higher voltages. They, the wide band gap devices have higher thermal conductivity, very wide, very large numbers, for example, for diamond. This means that they will have lower thermal uh, resistance. This means that heat is more easily transferred out from the device and uh, then this means that temperature increase is lower and reduced. Uh, this is gallium nitride is an exception to this general rule. Uh, they can operate at higher temperatures. Mm, there are literature uh, papers that report operation for silicon carbide devices up to 600 degrees. Silicon devices, on the other hand, can operate safely uh, to junction temperature around 150, 200 degrees. This is, this is due to the lower intrinsic carbon concentration. Uh, this depends, however, uh, this is a property of the material. In principle, gallium nitride, diamond, silicon carbide can work at higher temperature, in principle even if the limitations will probably come from other portion of the devices, for example, for the bonding, for the connections, even if diamond can work at 600 degrees, the connections will probably fail at much lower temperature. Even this means that if you want to design these devices, you also have to design new packages, new connections able to sustain 600 degrees. And this, is, this, is, this has not yet been, yet been done. Forward and reverse recovery characteristics uh, are usually more stable when you have bipolar devices, and this is important. Uh, bipolar devices in wide band gap semiconductors, when available, have excellent uh, reverse recovery characteristics. And this means that you have lower switching losses, lower electromagnetic interferences, and uh, you probably will not need snubbers or uh, circuitry that uh, uh, improves the switching for your devices. Because of the low switching losses and uh, the ability to work at higher temperatures, wide band gap semiconductor, semiconductor based devices can usually work at higher switching frequencies let's say higher than 20 kilohertz at, at high power um, and this is not 
possible, for example, for, for many silicon devices. There, are, there is one uh, noticeable exception um, that, uh, that is gallium nitride, uh, in which you design devices that are different from what we studied. These are the hemp, we will study them later. And these are very fast devices. For these uh, devices, uh, also switching frequencies up to 1 MHz are, in principle, possible. And this will change completely the, the design techniques. When you have to switch, instead of 100 kHz at 1 MHz, you, you have to change completely your driving circuitry, the connections, the, mm, the uh, the passive material, the passive components like inductance, echo, and the capacitors, everything. It is an interesting field, quite new and still uh, full of um, possible improvements. Which are the disadvantages compared to silicon? Uh, the yield is uh, usually low. The materials are not yet mature from a technology, technological point of view. There are defects into the material, and this means that uh, uh, the yield is lower. This, is this, this was a huge problem for silicon carbides. The wafers were full of defects. And we also have processing problems, for, for example, for gallium nitride. Diamond is even worse because it, it is the most recent materials, uh, diamond wafers are very small. You don't have five inch wafers, wafers, you cannot design big devices. And even so, the wafers are uh, very, very defective and it is very difficult to design a, a reliable big device on diamond for the moment. Uh, as a consequence, you have a high cost Uh, the, the availability uh, is yet limited. This is not, this sentence is not complete because it is true that silicon shotty diodes, silicon carbide shotty diodes are available now, but also gallium nitride, uh, let's say, type transistors are uh, also commercially available. Uh, Working in principle, these devices can work at higher temperature, but we need high temperature packaging techniques. And these packages that can work at 300 or 400 degrees are not yet available. The reliability problem is now there. And uh, when you try or you want to use very fast devices like the devices in gallium nitride, you will need packaging technologies and uh, passive components that will provide the least possible amount of parasitic components. And this is yet a, an issue. For example, gallium nitride devices that are sold now, in order to solve this problem, do not have the package. They are more or less bare devices, just gallium nitride soldered on the PCB. But this is possible in some applications. It's not possible in every application. There are uh, available environments where it is not possible to, to use bare devices. You have uh, external agents that are dangerous for the devices. These drawbacks are to be expected. Some of, them, some of them, these are not fundamental limitations. This is not something that cannot be solved in principle. Maybe that in the future these things will be solved and uh, we will have available and cheap wideband gap devices. The company that succeed in this uh, uh, task will be able to earn a lot, a lot of money and sold millions of devices, obviously. This said, which are the actual wide gap materials that we use and which are the commercially available devices? Gallium arsenide is actually not available for power, it, for the power devices that we studied. 
Uh, there are power devices, but mainly for radio frequency applications. So it is not some, something that we studied and we applied in these lectures. We then have silicon carbide. In silicon carbide, there are commercially available devices, uh, mostly unipolar devices. We have MOSFETs, 900 volts, and this is a large number. We have seen that uh, in silicon, MOSFETs are available for uh, voltages lower than 400, 300 volts. The only exception is the use of superjunction technology that will improve the state resistance and then we have some 400 700 volts devices but this is just for the use of super junction that is expensive complex these mosfets 900 volts and 1700 volts are just made in silicon carbide without the use of super junction then we have shotty diodes 600 volts up to 700 volts, 1700 volts, sorry. This is the uh, current. Uh, this number means also means how big the device is, uh, is manufactured. If you can get 50 amps, it, this means that you can uh, actually design and manufacture devices with quite high area with a good yield and uh, this is important for, um, for the technology. Then we have gallium nitride. This is a very hot topic now. The devices that we use in uh, gallium nitride are not the shorty diodes, the MOSFET. These are HEMT. That stays, this acronym stays for High Electron Mobility Transistor. We will study this later, the next, later, later the next lecture. And uh, this is a, a good commercial success for, for the moment. There are uh, commercially available devices, but these are for the low voltage range. 300 volt, 30 volt, 300 volts, 60 amp, 4 amp. This is the range. As you can see, in the high voltage, voltage range, silicon carbide is uh, a reality. In the low voltage range, gallium nitride is a reality. In principle, if these materials improve and become more reliable, more uh, cheaper, and uh, etc., they could swap out the space for silica. Because in the low voltage range, we have, gall we have gallium nitride. In the high voltage range, we will have silicon carbide. But this is not yet the case. Then we have diamond. For diamond, we don't have commercially available devices. We are still in the research phase. Uh, some shorty diodes have been demonstrated. That's, this means that it has been manufactured, measured, and you get uh, the current, but without any commercially available, available product. And there is one proposal from the just research proposal for uh, a kind of MOSFET in diamond. It's more a claim than a real device. Let's say we were able to do something and we measured something and it looks like a, a MOSFET. We are still very far. Now, listing what uh, we can actually uh, find uh, in the market. Uh, for gallium arsenide, it is, in principle, a material that could be used for power devices. Uh, however, uh, this is the we, we have seen we have said before that these materials could improve the performance with respect, with respect to silicon, and we say that we could improve either the band gap that is improving the avalanche ionization or we could improve the carrier mobility carrier mobility uh, for gallium arsenide the main improvement comes from the uh, larger mobility of the uh, electrons the larger electron the um, because the band gap for gallium arsenide is slightly larger than silicon no much improvement in this sense but the mobility is much larger. 
However, uh, this improvement has not been exploited for power semiconductor devices uh, used, for, used for power electronics, but mainly for uh, radio frequency applications. In that field, gallium arsenide is an important material, but we do not have uh, devices for uh, the design of the CDC converters and inverters in our field. For silicon carbide, on the other hand, uh, we have a uh, higher band gap. The band gap is 3.2 electron volts that is much larger than silicon. The mobility is not much better than silicon, or better. Uh, at most interface, it is even lower than silicon. However, due to the very large band gap, these devices a very large critical electric field, 20 times larger than silicon. This means that we can use very thin layers to sustain this breakdown voltage. And this means that unipolar devices like MOSFET and Shotty diodes will have improved performances. And this is why we have commercially available devices that are MOSFET and silicon carbide and uh, Shotty diodes. In principle, the larger silicon carbide band gap allows larger maximum temperature of operation. Silicon carbides are available, as we have seen, for, for 600, 1700 volts, but there are proposals for very high voltage, breakdown voltage up to 10 kilowatts and more. This could be attractive for very high voltage applications. The problems mainly come from the material quality, not as good as for silicon, and the large cost of silicon carbide wafers. Another problem is the reduced electron mobility at the MOSFET interface. The mobility is not that bad in the bulk of the material, when we have a shotty diode, for example, but when we have the MOSFET interface, the mobility of the carriers is very low. This is one of the... When we compare these materials with silicon, we understand how lucky we were with silicon. The silicon dioxide interface with silicon is a very good interface. The silicon dioxide grows very easily, does not create damage on the silicon behind, below, and in the end you get a very nice interface with good mobility. And this silicon uh, is also, can also be used to protect the material from, from the bulk. For other materials, this is not, this, it's not like this. For silicon carbide, as an example, when you grow the oxide on the top, the damage on the bulk material is large and the mobility is reduced. This means that MOSFETs have, uh, have larger on state resistance, in principle. This is the uh, possible explanation, uh, let's say, a uh, visible explanation of the difference. Given the very large critical electric field that is 20 times larger than for silicon, in this plot we can see that if with silicon we have to design, this is a PIM diode, a very thick and lightly doped layer, from silicon carbide, we can get a very thin layer with a much larger electric field and get the same rectal voltage. This is not only an advantage in terms of onset resistance, but if you think of bipolar devices, a very thin layer means very small amount of stored charge when you have the conductivity modulation. And this means that for the same rectal voltage, you get a reverse recovery that is negligible if we compare silicon carbide to silicon bipolar devices. This is uh, uh, another important advantage. This is, for example, uh, the difference between a, a 600 volt shock t rectifier in silicon carbide compared with the silicon counterpart the difference is huge. Uh, 
you don't see here that the on state voltage drop the difference in, in the on state voltage drop but this is also uh, better the on state voltage drop is lower for the silicon carbide device for the data sheet we get 1.7 volts at 10 amp okay we don't have the area so we don't know which is the specific on state resistance but for uh, the device in silicon it is 2.1 volts at the same current and this is the reverse recovery behavior first of all the reverse recovery in silicon is huge while in silicon carbide it is negligible further when we increase the temperature and this is the case when you use your device the lifetime increases in silicon in for usual uh, lifetime control techniques you have this increase on the lifetime with temperature and this means that the reverse recovery increases. On the other hand, the silicon carbide device is stable with very small reverse recovery. You understand that from this plot, the, the improvement is incredible and uh, we should not in principle discuss bipolar uh, shotty devices or PIM devices in silicon, but this is not the case because still silicon devices are very very cheap and uh, if the you don't need these huge performances probably they are the best choices this is the, uh, the difference in the specific constant resistance the plot does not take into account the use of superjunction technique mm, and uh, you can see the different the difference for the the same breakdown voltage, the specific on resistance is uh, 100 times lower for silicon carbide and silicon. This can be improved using superjunction, but in principle, we could do the same also for silicon carbide. Uh, there is no use of superjunction in silicon carbide because uh, for the moment, we, are, we still have a limitation not given by the material by, but by the termination for example or other problems that limit your breakdown let's say uh, the thickness of the ap layer in silicon carbide uh, even even if it is it is very small in principle can sustain a lot of voltage the limitations come from other portions of the devices so you don't need for the moment the use of superjunction in silicon carbide This is a, a, an advertisement table for silicon carbide products and devices. And uh, these are also the, the companies that work in the field. Cree is a very famous one that pro produces a lot of devices. But there are many, many companies that work in the silicon carbide devices. And there is not only Shakti dials and MOSFET, but there are also proposals for PIM, MESFET, transistor, and JFET, or things like, the, like, like that. Finally, uh, a significant portion of this lecture will be given, will be dedicated to gallium nitride, but we will uh, do this uh, on next week. We just say here that gallium nitride material uh, is in a huge development phase. There are commercially available pro products that provide astonishing performances in uh, certain applications. This, is, uh, this could be a real shift in the paradigm. In conclusion of this lecture, we have uh, wide band gap materials that allow a large performance improvement in power devices. Various materials have been proposed as uh, the base for this wide band, wide, band, wide band gap material. Silicon carbide and gallium nitride are a reality, commercially available devices. This is, there is a huge research activity conducted in universities and research centers and development conducting in companies and there are activities conducting in the, in the, the development of the material because we need 
uh, more reliable technology, higher quality materials, the ideation of new devices. Since these devices, these materials are new, it is possible that you can design devices different from the well-known PIN diode, IGBT thyristors. Maybe there is something new you can find. Modeling and simulation, this is also very important. You need to, to understand how these devices work and where are the limitations and how to improve the devices. And as always, improvement and reliability, cost reduction. Which will be the winner and will be, which one will be the future will be, as usual, decided by the market and the cost and the applications. <laughs>